as I was uh, doing game-based learning and honestly trying to defend the practice to my colleagues, I, I started down the rabbit hole of, of pursuing how do I prove that these methods actually work? I see it in my classroom, but since my colleagues aren't there, they don't know. And so it didn't seem too far out of my way to uh, take some educational courses as well. And thus we landed here. Uh, Mr. Ken Cozy, uh, who was called Mr. Cozy by both students, uh, was my supervisor for this practicum. Unfortunately, it couldn't be here since his regrets. Um, and I'm quite. Uh, sad that he wouldn't be able to make it because I think the, the experience and the enthusiasm, he has about 20 years of experience in the classroom, um, that he could uh, share and, and the perspectives that he could uh, present to you uh, would have been at least as valuable as anything I could say today. Um, so as I said, I've, I've had some experience using uh, game design in the classroom. Um, I did it for my uh, undergrads in political science, and uh, this was in a junior high school in Edmonton, Alberta. And if we are to, to code it in sort of LARP theory or LARP jargon, it would be have been an indoor type of parlor LARP uh, with no touching. Um, and this was in the spring of 2017. Uh, Mr. Cozy gave me three. The parallel grade nines to teach, um, one of them being in fact a special needs class, which was about 10 students. That had some very interesting implications and challenges in itself. I had not had too much experience with um, the students with those situations that they brought into the classroom. Um, altogether, uh, there were all, just about 80 of, of the students that I had. Um, and um, Basically, what I was given, uh, the Alberta Program of Studies uh, tells the teachers what they are supposed to teach in the classroom. There is a whole catalog of central concepts that you have to teach to the students. Uh, you're not supposed to deviate from that too much. Um, and uh, so the, the, the syllabus, if you will, was set for me. Uh, and the unit was uh, issues for Canadians, economic systems, Canada and the United States, and, and therefore it might be interesting that I wasn't actually doing anything that was in contemporary Canada or the United States, is that we went to the world after everything had ended. Um, but it brings out um, that sometimes when you want to teach things and, and simulate things, you want to simplify them to bring out the processes more clearly. And when you look at the actual core concepts that the program of study uh, tells teachers that they have to teach, it's very basic economics. It doesn't really have to have the label of Canada and the United States. The reason it has that, of course, is that students are in Canada and they live next to the United States. These are the realities that they're used to. And if you look in the textbook, it talks about mixed market economy and, and free market economy because it's the classic sort of traditional ways that the public space is talking about the contract between the two countries. So when it says we're comparing Canada and the United States, it's really talking about different modes of, of uh, market economies. So the key point is, what are some types of economies? That's what I was set to teach. Uh, and that's just sort of what I brought out there. Uh, the, uh, I'll get back to the results here, but uh, they, they were quite engaged. And I'll tell you more about that uh, when I get to the details of the experience. However, I'm not sure that what we did actually did fulfill the three criteria uh, that, um, how do I pronounce it? Mohawki? I'm not sure. I have a Mohawki. That sounds, Mohawki. that sounds. Mohawki. Uh, the three criteria for uh, good edge alone. And I'll tell you why in a little bit. I mentioned uh, that the unit introduces basic economics concepts. Uh, and to move the unit to a post-apocalyptic scenario, I mean, it's dramatic for, for ninth graders, right? That's, that's part of the, the attraction and the motivation. Now we're, we're in, in the Mad Max world, if you will. I, I'm not sure if they hadn't seen Mad Max, and I'm not sure I would want to. Well, grade 9, 15, I, I guess that's OK. But it's, it's parents have to judge. 
Um, but it, it sets the stage for something dramatic, uh, which can be more adventurous and appealing. I suppose. Used Mutant Gear Zero, the role playing. How many have heard of that one? Okay, a few. Um, the, the funny part is, I never actually played Mutant Gear Zero myself. I got the rule book, and I felt this would work perfectly for what I'm going to do in the classroom. And I've been wanting to play it, but I've had other projects put in the way. Um, the role playing game has these three dimensions of play that translates really well to, to this particular learning <coughs> course. Um, having play characters, which you will see in any given tabletop role play game, and, and marks. Uh, but also these two levels of base management, where the, the players start out as survivors in the post apocalyptic world, but they live together in a community and the food has just run out. So now they have to emerge into that wild outside, but at the same time uh, develop their own uh, shelter and make it more and more sophisticated over time. And that's codified in this total tabletop role playing game. So in the tabletop game, the characters would go out into a map and roll for what they can find in those different map grids and slowly but surely uh, use the resources they find to build their own base and make it more sophisticated in terms of defense or food supply and so on and so forth. So it makes for a really good economic simulation, really, because it's about scarcity, and economics is about scarcity. <laughs> now, these are the, the key concepts, the key uh, uh, sort of uh, tools that I used and designed for this. Uh, this was not designed by me, it was designed by my wife, she's the graphic designer. Uh, and it's, it's really the uh, Edmonton after the apocalypse, if you will. Uh, Mutant Year Zero does have uh, advice for how you can take any given city, your own city, and process it through Photoshop. And since my wife's Photoshop skills are much better than mine, um, I asked her and said, please, and she agreed. Uh, you will see here that I've marked it, uh, and this is a result of the actual play. Um, the, the first thing that happened, I'm kind of jumping here, narrative, which you'll notice in the uh, slides, but uh, bear with me. Um, the first thing uh, on day one that uh, when we started the unit uh, that we did was that I had the students choose where they would put their so-called art, that's another term from, from the uh, tabletop game, their shelter. And I had designed it so that all three of the classes would be in the same world. So on, in this post-apocalyptic Edmonton, there were three shelters um, for these classes and they had the potential of running into each other. Uh, it was quite interesting to find that two of the classes then decided to set up their base just next to each other. And I was, I was kind of wondering how, how, how really south this would go really fast if they chose to make, uh, Mr. Cozy made some comments about this, that this can go badly if they decide to bring out, you know, some, someone finds a machine gun as part of their um, uh, artifact um, uh, role. And, and then start to go to town on the other one. Um, but that didn't happen. Um, instead, there was a great deal more collaboration than uh, apparently it was the word. But these green check marks show where they had been exploring. So as we went on, uh, I used these, this map, and this was really, I put it in Roll20. So I had three Roll20 accounts going, and I would show them their part of the map that they had been exploring. And they would go out into these areas and try to see if they could find food or um, machines left from the civilization before them and use that to improve their, their settlement. Now this would be the character sheet. Um, and basically what all these uh, attributes and skills did was to drive uh, the, the uh, exploration of how scarcity works in an economy. Uh, they would lose health if they didn't have enough food at the end of the class. Uh, they would need their skills to uh, build farms or to uh, build other uh, amenities and utilities that they needed in their shelters. And uh, they would want to keep track of the things they might uh, find or build together uh, to improve their community. Uh, but there was always scarcity to think about. Uh, the first couple of days, uh, they were 
a bit thrown off by the game because it was not quite something they were used to. And I was using also um, the uh, web platform uh, uh, Resly to keep track of their learning. Uh, so while they were um, working on improving their community, uh, they discovered that if they did the, the, the um, assignments that I, I gave them to learn about the economy, they would level up their skills. That could be labor skills to, to, that would help with building things like farmlands. It could be research skills that would help them understand the artifacts that they found from the lost civilization. Um, there was also a flight skill because uh, defense is part of, of life. Uh, but also uh, social skills and so on and so forth. Um, so as the, the time went on, they understood that if I learn these concepts really well, my character is going to do fantastically in this game. And so that's how I, I, I sort of drew together um, the, the um, motivation and engagement from games to uh, encourage them to learn. And these are some of the ex examples of how that manifests. So, after a week or so, you would have the students in the hallway talk to the students from the other classes about, you know, where are you on the map? Oh, we're not telling. <laughs> uh, and, you know, I don't like the people who are leading us in our arc right now. Uh, maybe we could join up and do a revolution. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, they would choose different systems of government, you know, how do we manage, uh, uh, how do we make decisions collectively. One arc went with direct democracy and lost a lot of time discussing everything all the time. <laughs> um, the other went for some kind of authoritarian state and lost a lot of time when the leaders decided to pursue things that wasn't possibly the most optimal for the rest of the community. So they learned about systems of government too. And then at the end of the whole simulation, uh, because I wanted, I didn't want any of them to, to go for totalitarianism, but they didn't. Uh, but I did want to show them what totalitarianism does to an economic system. So I had a, a role of invasion um, towards the end of, of uh, the weeks that we were working where a bunch of robots took over all the arcs and told everybody exactly what they had to do in very small detail, um, paranoia style. And, and I think that kind of worked in terms of, <laughs> in terms of teaching them how to not run an economy. Um, uh, but. Uh, all of these effects, all these behaviors that the students exhibited was what I was hoping for and uh, what showed them how scarcity works. So skill specialization, uh, collaboration, collective decision making. Do we need tax? What for? Ah, oh, okay. Um, and also all the initiatives they would come with. Um, a student built an art gallery. Another one built a very advanced septic tank system for uh, uh, community waste treatment um, that cleaned up a lot of their food, by the way. So they were feeling much better as characters over the time. Um, so yes, there, there, was, there was a lot of uh, uh, positive um, uh, engagement and discussion between the students about scarcity and about how to make collective decision making and so on. Quite an uh, advanced. Uh, discussion, I would say. Now, was if we go back to the three criteria to, to sort of uh, tie up uh, with the presentation, uh, it was the monodisciplinary, that's the first criteria. Uh, we focused on economics, and any discussions on uh, governmental systems was how does that affect your economy. It did communicate the textbook subject matter to the students. Um, I admit that I complicated things by saying that the, the textbook was wrong about how it classifies the US and the Canadian system because that's based on the 80s and things have happened, but that's, that's because I'm, I'm a nerd that way. Uh, <laughs> but the big problem here is I don't think, I'm not sure that this can be easily replicated by another teacher, certainly not someone who is not used to game based learning to the tools that I use, like Resley. Uh, never seen year zero, uh, so and that's something that me and Mr. Cozy talked about afterwards. That you know, uh, maybe we can do something. So this is what's coming next this summer. My wife is very graciously helping me to uh, put this into 
some form of, of, of an artifact that we can give to other teachers so they can use. And I have no idea what's going to happen after that, but I'm dying to find out. Thank you. And uh, from Russia. Uh, so uh, forgive me for my English, if anything. <laughs> and uh, yes, I'll talk about uh, socializing uh, teenagers in the orphanages using the log method. Two years ago, I've been talking about our project, which is called the Noon Project on the Call. And today, I want to tell you like what results we got during the last years. But um, of course, at first, uh, I need to tell you what's the Noon Project about, because I don't think that everyone knows about us that we are like pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, we are a non-profit organization and we are a group of uh, Russian lovers. Uh, we are about 15 people, most of us are in Moscow and me and a couple of other crazy guys are in St. Petersburg. Um, we established this project like six or even seven years ago as a volunteer project and then little by little we got uh, some financial help and uh, then we started to spread out across the whole country. Now we work in uh, about 24 provinces of uh, 80 provinces of Russia uh, and uh, what we do is we are making LARPs with teenagers uh, who live in the orphanages and other um, rehabilitation centers for uh, teenagers who have problems with their families or with law and uh, all the stuff like that. Uh, we're coming to every um, orphanage once a week or once in a fortnight and we are making a lap with them. One lap lasts uh, about one hour and a half or two hours and it includes from 8 to 15 or 20 participants. They may be of different age so that depends on the uh, particular orphanage. In some groups there are only 15 year olders and in some groups there, are, there can be all of them from 12 to 17 or 18. And the goal is to improve social skills and make them more adapted to the future life when they are on their own because after they graduate the orphanage, uh, the state considers them to be like independent and uh, no one cares about them. And uh, after having spent a lot of time in the orphanage they just often don't know how to live on their own because they are used to being decided for them everything because their schedule of everyday life is tightly planned for them by their teachers or by the administration and so they just don't know how to live on their own and even if they have money they have an apartment to live and some social help uh, they often go to prison or uh, spend all their enormous money for, during one year and then they are like outlaws. So we decided that it's a good idea to try to improve the situation. And so currently we are working in more than 75 orphanages all over the country. In my region, St. Petersburg, it's uh, nine orphanages uh, and in all the other regions it's like two or three orphanages in every region. And we work with other uh, non-profit organizations, so not, not all of these LARPs that you can see on the slide were held by me. Other non-profits who help us in different provinces. Uh, and we made some researches that show significant improvement of uh, the relevant skills for the participants of our project compared to those who didn't participate. Uh, so, a bit... Uh, about why did we choose into LARPs. Uh, of course, one reason is that we are lovers and we consider LARPs uh, as a means that can change the world. But in fact, uh, it, it is obvious that uh, LARPs in, involve people emotionally and when you are involved, you are eager to, to try what you have never tried. Yeah? Uh, to, to be in the situation where you have never been and to try to be not yourself, to try some other things, not to be afraid of and this helps us put the participants into the situation and try to form their social skills and make them use some practical skills because some LARPs are um, professionally oriented so they're trying to do in game what they can do in reality say LARPs about how to connect people to the internet and about all this technical stuff 
So they tried uh, in mo mo modeling this uh, real skills that they will need if they choose this profession. Mm, and of course we model choice in real life situations and provide them with personal experience um, because we are having a reflection to, to part of the lab where we discuss what we got in game and how we can use it in the real life. So this is more or less how um, we do it in every orphanage. In general, the result of the research is that uh, students get better communicative skills and learn how to plan their life, how to anticipate their future, because they are really afraid of that. And uh, often they say in the beginning, like, what will you be? I will be the president, or I will be an outlaw, a drug dealer, I will be homeless and die in the age of 25. So these are two poles, and they often don't have anything in the middle, in between. And we are trying to form them, uh, to make them think that it's not really so scary to be on your own. And we are trying to help them uh, being more uh, sure in themselves. Uh, and of course we are giving them some knowledge about professions and life navigation, so what to do in your life and how you can do it, based on your own knowledge and on your own wishes. Uh, and they get some personal development, uh, they start to contribute to realization of their dreams and aspirations, not to just dreaming about them. And they become less egocentric, less uh, concentrated on their own problems and more, how to say, social centric, as we call it. So uh, what we did, we had four psychological tests, it was one semester last year, it, the, the next time it was a questionnaire and a semi-structured interview with every participant. And uh, we also interviewed uh, the volunteers uh, who work with these children. And we interviewed their teachers, if they see some progress. And this uh, research is in progress now, because now it's the end of uh, the semester, the school year. So we'll be interviewing the teachers like next week. Uh, about the socialization skill testing. Uh, are there any psychologists here? Okay, so uh, these are four um, common Russian psychological methods, uh, the first four. Uh, and uh, all over the country, we took about 750 teenagers from 43 orphanages. Uh, and you see, uh, there was 600 that are like just normal teenagers and uh, there were those who have health problems and who are uh, backwards, yeah? I don't know the, the term, sorry. <laughs> yeah, uh, so the results are that, um, the, uh, the results considering um, the, the, the norm are much better. Uh, that's because we are not really professionals in working with other groups uh, and uh, now we, we don't have uh, time to, to develop in that direction, so I will talk about more. Uh, so communication becomes much more valuable for them. They, they start to be less rude, start to be less aggressive talking to each other. And they are, trying, they are starting to understand the value of every person, little by little. And they tend to cooperate and to have longer relations. Their problem is that when they move from orphanage to orphanage or when uh, their teachers move like from group to group, they uh, don't know how to create uh, long relationships. And that's uh, what becomes more valuable for them uh, during participating in, in our course. So they try to analyze reasons and positions of other people. And uh, one third of them become more oriented on the action they are doing, more concentrated on the results of their everyday job or studies, and uh, not only on their personality. So we um, can mention increasing interest to task and problem solving, and that's a really cool idea. <laughs> And uh, from the point of view of their own will, they become more de de determined, as I have already said, in fulfilling their plans. Um, and uh, yeah, they make their plans and goals more realistic, so they don't change their mind as often as before. Like, I'll go to that college. Oh no, I don't want to get a math exam and go to that college, and so on. And this is also a problem, because they often try to use the easiest way, which is not the best way, of course. 
And yeah, uh, they don't give up so often after mistakes and faults. Uh, this is also good because uh, uh, the problem of Russian educational system on the whole is that uh, from the uh, early years, they, this system shows us that mistakes is bad. Like, who mistakes is a silly, idly person. And we are trying to show them that mistakes are a normal way of uh, every person to grow up. Uh, but it's difficult like when all the system tells uh, the contrary. Uh, yeah, then uh, their self-esteem becomes more reasonable. So, and uh, what's also interesting, we had a questionnaire about uh, what makes them uh, feel uncomfortable while they are laughing. Because this also shows the uh, different problems they have in uh, real life in their group, for example, with whom we are laughing. And uh, you see that the biggest problems they have is communication. Even if we establish some orders, some rules, like uh, we raise our hands or we are not rude, we are not uh, swearing during the alarms, uh, it is still very difficult for them to communicate. Though it is easier when they have a particular goal to, to fulfill. Uh, yeah, and behavior for them is also very difficult because they are uh, very used to kicking each other and uh, to being aggressive in many different ways. Boys to girls, girls to boys, boys among themselves and so on. Um, yeah, and of course there are conflicts in the group. Um, yeah, and motivation is also a problem because uh, these uh, teenagers are really not motivated doing anything. Like, let me just lie on my bed and play my cell phone. And that's what I need, and I don't care what happens in five years and so on. And this is uh, this this needs also a lot of psychological help not only from us, but from their teachers. Um, yeah. So, to conclude, uh, as I said, we find significant improvement of uh, skills for children who took part in the program, and um, the teenagers get better self-control and try to understand and start to understand their emotions better and to control them. Uh, and. Uh, they communicate easier and less aggressively, and I find it uh, really worthwhile to, to continue doing. Uh, the limitation of the study is that there is some participant turnover because uh, uh, the groups are not of the same age, the participants, and some graduate during the during participation in our program. Some are adopted, some are moved to the other uh, orphanage, who, which we don't work with, for example. So, uh, not all of them have participated all the three years of the pro program. Some have participated in six or ten or twelve months. Uh, yeah. So, our future plans is to make more practical oriented labs, so to give them more skills uh, and to continue it. Uh, and uh, we are looking for people who are also interested uh, in this project and working with school children or orphans from abroad because we also tried it at schools and it works and we tried it with volunteers who are my age or a bit younger or in their 40s and this also works so uh, our labs can be adopted for different groups and uh, I'm running one of our labs on Saturday night so the one who comes can see how it works uh, so we are really very interested in to transmitting our method to, to, to different organizations and if you are also interested, let's communicate. Uh, and here are my contacts. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, so before I start, I just want to preface by saying what I'm going to talk about is probably things that, that you all already know very well and you're going to say, oh yeah, Andrew, we already knew that. Um, but this is, is hopefully a cool way to kind of show uh, that what we do in the LARP world uh, really does work, and we like test it empirically, and, like experiment it. Work. Um, I'm also very new to the LARP world. Um, I attended Kinderpunk for the first time uh, last year, and just fell in love. I love this world, and I really love you guys. I appreciate you. So, anyways, without further ado, we will jump in. Um, so. To, to give you an idea of what we're doing here, uh, so the main topic is looking at like theme, 
um, narrative and like creating new immersive worlds for for uh, summer camps in a summer camp setting. Um, and the the theoretical underpinnings, um, like Rebecca mentioned, is in this theory of structured experiences, um, which is a theory that was created by my advisor, uh, Dr. Gary Ellis, is his name at Texas A&M, um, and it just kind of puts structure around this word of experience, because experience is become very buzzword, and kind of tries to define, um, as I guess everyone has tried to do, but define words like engagement and immersion and other things like that, which it's, it's, we won't go there. <laughs> Um, so that's kind of where a lot of this is based. It also comes a lot, um, a lot from the Experience Economy, which is a book that was originally written in 1999 um, that talks about this idea of essentially elevating services that we offer to, uh, in my opinion, just add like some pixie dust is kind of what we call it, to, to elevate normal services to an experience. So you've got a, um, an organization who offers a, uh, a summer camp service, right, where you drop your kids, they go and they, they have this summer camp, whatever the service, they have counselors and they have people that take care of them, they've got a house, etc. Um, but what can we do to elevate that experience um, of going to summer camp to make it more memorable? Um, and essentially some of the things we looked at in this study were how can we make summer camp a place that's not only memorable, but that kids will go home and they'll tell their siblings about it, they'll tell their friends about it, um, they'll tell you know their families, all kinds of other people about this camp because it was such a memorable experience that they just want to shout from the rooftops, you know, how great summer camp was. Um, and that was originally kind of what happened uh, is that we got approached by this uh, residential summer camp, a 4-H organization um, in Texas. Uh, I don't know, maybe this is the same everywhere, but in Texas there are so many summer camps, just so many. Everyone goes to camp every summer, hands down. Lots of them are like Christian related camps, um, but 4-H is more like an agriculture type organization, although their camp isn't ag related necessarily. Anyways, but they kind of approached us and said, we really are having a hard time um, bringing in kids because there's so many camps and it's such a competitive um, market for summer camp that we need to do something um, to essentially elevate the quality of the experiences that we offer, but we don't have any money. We can't buy a lot of stuff which I think is often the case with, with most camps. There are some that are a little fancier and have a lot of money. Um, but, but they have to do a lot with a little, essentially. Um, and so we decided to come in, and in the experience economy, one of the first things they talk about in experience design or creating memorable experiences is using a theme. Um, and so I kind of thought this was a good way to start to introduce LARP to the summer camp without actually telling them. And for future research, we'll get in. They're going to be LARPing in no time. They're um, but uh, we wanted to introduce a theme and a narrative and create like a small new immersive world for, for these camps. So what we decided to do is uh, we took, we had three different camps that we worked with, um, all for three different camp sessions, I should say. Um, so one was just a normal camp session, we didn't change anything about it, so they just went along and did everything as normal. Um, one of them was a partially new immersive world and we did that by just creating a narrative. So there were no tangible props or anything. It was just just a narrative that we created. Each of the activities at camp had its own narrative inside of this big narrative. And then the, the third camp was fully themed or it was uh, more immersive. And we had the same narratives, but we also included like tangible props. So there were signs, we had people wearing costumes, we had the kids in costumes, we had um, different like trinkets and things that they were interacting with. So we had these three different um, one thing that, and then we'll talk about a little bit later, but that was important to designing these, the, the new immersive worlds was that we got the uh, camp counselors very early on in order to kind of get them to buy in and really participate, because we had them create the immersive worlds and the narratives around them. So during the first week of their training, we went up to their training um, in Brownwood and we essentially said, kind of laid out the idea and then we had them just brainstorm and work together and they created the overarching world that we were gonna be in. And then they broke off into their eight groups. So there's eight different activities, normal camp activities like archery and riflery and fishing and stuff like that. They broke off into their eight groups and they designed mini worlds that fit inside of this world. Um, and I think that, that was really important because uh, it's often easy for us to go in as organizers or people who think we know what we're doing, right? And say, Hey guys, we're gonna like create this awesome themed experience for the campers. 
and then they don't really like the idea, or it wasn't theirs, or we thought it was awesome, but it was crap, right? Mm -hmm. um, so anyways, that was really important, is to get buy-in from the counselors, from the staff, to help us create some of these new schools, which is really awesome. Participants that were at the camp, we had a pretty wide range of people, which wasn't ideal. I would have liked to maybe have something a little bit more specific, but they ranged from 8 to 17 years old. So it was a pretty wide range of kids. Um, and, uh, but we gathered a whole lot of observations from them. It was really great. And we were essentially looking at, first of all, um, how do, does a new immersive world affect these individual experiences, like just the rivalry experience or just the, uh, the fishing experience? Then second, how do those individual experiences lead to an overall camp experience, like over the three or four days? How does that affect that? And then based on that, how then do, um, do campers go forward to promote for the camp, to tell more people about that? So those were kind of our three main things that, that we were looking at as we went through. Um, and we had different indicators of quality, essentially, of the camp, and uh, we'll talk about those in a little bit, but essentially, one was kind of similar to a flow state, one was the overall like, delight of the camp, and then the other was perceived value um, of what they were participating in. So these are the key points that we'll talk about um, moving forward. It's essentially kind of what were the results as we, um, as we measured some of these things and talked about you know, kind of what were the effects of having these universal worlds. Um, what does this mean for camps, right? I mean, if this is in fact important, then what does this mean moving forward? Um, and also this, I guess the second point is more so like, some activities don't necessarily lend themselves well, at least in this specific example or experience, um, to having a new as we'll see, which is a little bit bad. Um, I also wanted, I guess, to back up and give you a little context. So one example, the overarching theme, surprise, surprise, was like Wild Wild West, Texas, of course. Mm -hmm. right? Um, but so one of the examples, um, just to give you a taste of, of what happened, is um, so they had one. They had a challenge course, right? So the normal challenge course at camp, where you climb up the the pole or you uh, go up the cargo net and then slide down the uh, like zip line, right? So the narrative that they set up there was that they were at this Paladero Canyon in Texas, and they had just mined a whole lot of gold. So we had all this gold that they got to take in their little pouches. Um, and we kind of talked about how we were mining gold, they would dig some of it up and they would take it. And then, but then they noticed, or at least the, the camp counselors who were also dressed up, um, noticed that there were in hot pursuit some bandits who were coming to get them. And it was really fun. So they had these binoculars. This is fun, it's kind of cheesy, but it was fun. And so on this pole, like quite a ways away, we had put a little army of like, like green army men on the very top of this pole. So each of the kids would be able to look through their binoculars and see this little army like really far away, you know, heading towards them. And so, so because of that, they had to escape, right? So they had to climb up this bluff, which was the cargo net. So they climbed up this bluff, um, they had to secure their gold, hook in, and then slide across the canyon to safety to get away from these bandits. So that's just to kind of give you an idea of like the narratives that we were talking about um, which I was really proud of these camp counselors, you know, like for, for people who, who are not into acting or LARP or any of these things, I was, I was pretty thrilled uh, with, with what they did. Um, so, so looking at like how we measure things, so we looked at um, for the individual experiences, again, these are like the eight activities that they participated in. So the, the fishing and riflery, the arts and crafts and stuff like that. What was their perceived value and delight during those experiences um, in the uh, in the new immersive world terms? How those significantly led to higher like overall quality, so of the camp overall, um, which were all significant, and then overall engagement. So this is going into the theory of structured experiences, which we all talk about engagement differently, but, but in the theory of structured experiences. Um, engagement talks about experiences that include a storyline, which is kind of what we were going for here, creating a narrative. And so an engaging experience as measured in the theory of structured experiences is coherent, um, it's provocative, and it's self-relevant. So that's what we were measuring is, are these experiences or narratives that we created, are they those things, and are they kind of creating a cohesive story? Um, and then we saw that those three things of those overall camp experiences led to a higher, um, 
likely to promote. Like the kids were, were more likely to, to promote to their family members, to their friends, um, etc. Uh, which was really good and exciting for them. Um, so this is something that's kind of interesting, and I'll kind of point out there's a lot of graphs going on here, I apologize. Um, but, so we looked at this interaction between new immersive worlds and activities, because it's going to vary, right? By activity, um, it's just a little bit different. So as you can see here, so these purple, so these are the activities down here. There's like crafts, swimming, rivalry, etc. And so more often than not, one of these um, themed or immersive worlds was the best every time. There was only a couple instances here. This is so. This is delight. That's perceived value, and this is deep structured experience, which is this this state of like effortless concentration where you forget about your time and your worries and you're just intrinsically motivated to participate. So every time themed experiences or new immersive worlds were better here. Then over here we had some random things with delight, where like dance, the dance activity, and fishing. And then for perceived value, the dance activity. These are the non-immersive world settings, um, these red ones, that were better. They had higher perceived value and higher delight during the non-immersive world activities. And we have no idea why. I don't know. I, mean, I was there for all these activities. It wasn't like uh, the counselors did a bad job that day at telling the narrative. Um, so to be continued. We're not really sure what's going on. Um, what does this mean for camps? So looking, uh, talking with the camp organization, it was really important because this is kind of what they wanted to see, like can we do something with no resources essentially? Um, so that's kind of this first point is that we were able to elevate the camp experience a little bit um, without having to spend a bunch of money. We didn't have to buy like a giant blob for the lake, you know, that you can jump on or new bikes or, uh, or anything crazy. All we had to do was invest a little bit of time. We spent a little bit of money on props and then just a couple hours of training. Um, and we're able to get uh, what I thought were really cool um, results or outcomes. Um, this was something that was kind of interesting because there were a couple of counselors who weren't very interested in, uh, in getting into character, right? Playing, playing uh, the sheriff or playing a bandit or something like that. So when, uh, when looking for camp counselors, that was something that we recommended for this year is that they kind of be intentional about who they, uh, who they hire and some of the things that they're interested in. Um, and then again, just uh, just thinking about the competitive nature of the market, something to look for next year that we want to look at or this summer, I guess, is really comparing camps maybe that do spend more money. Um, and is that actually better? Maybe it is, maybe it's not. So that's something that we want to continue to look for. So just to kind of wrap up, we found that new immersive worlds do yield higher higher quality experiences for, for campers, um, both on an individual activity level, on an overall camp experience, and also towards promoting and uh, helping bring more people into the camp situation. Um, a couple of limitations is that, I mean, we didn't use this like for a very whatever academic people, but we went in like random, use random assignment with our camps. I would have liked to use more camps. I mean, we have two or three camps per manipulation, which would have been great, but we just didn't really have the time for this one. Um, and there's lots of things I'd like to do moving forward. Like next year, I'd like to help them maybe create their own characters within Worlds, right, with the kids instead of just saying, okay, you are like a camper, but you're in this wild world list. But have them create characters and start to incorporate more LARP elements to create an even more immersive uh, experience. And hopefully, that will continue to elevate their, their, the quality of their camp experiences. Uh, my name is Kristen. Um, my company's Mastermind Adventures. Uh, this is Evan uh, Colbert. He is a licensed social worker. Um, and this is also Peter. I just totally like on your last name. Peter, this is Peter, um, and he works for the Justice Resource Institute. And I brought them along with me because I think that um, you know I'll talk to you a little bit about Mastermind Adventures, kind of our journey. Um, but I think some of the most interesting stuff that we're doing right now has to do with these two guys, and it's the therapeutic applications, both for tabletop and for um, live action role play. So Mastermind Adventures started about six years ago as kind of a volunteer venture. My children are homeschooled. Uh, one of them has autism, so we were looking for ways to connect our kids with other kids and to kind of help them find activities where they could make friends, get moving, um, and you know, kind of keep, continue their own education. Um, so it came about as really we were just organizing events for homeschoolers. Uh, one of the first things that we did was organize NERF events for homeschoolers, and when we had 100 kids show up one night, we were like, oh, this is a thing. 
Um, we've got kids who do not exercise otherwise or are just on their video games, and they are now running around, talking to each other, making friends. So that was the first aha moment for us. Um, the second aha moment was when we organized our first LARP event with the help of my cousin, who's videotaping, and her boyfriend at the time. Um, and it was a Camp Half-Blood Percy Jackson-inspired event. Um, we had hoped we could get 20 kids there. We organized it just for homeschoolers, and we had 175 kids show up. And so this is our fourth year running that event. It's actually happening next Saturday, so stay tuned. You can watch our Facebook page for information on that. Um, but what we're finding is that these programs are really connecting with kids. They're connecting with kids in a way that, um, you know, I think in one of the things that we wanted to talk about is that I think everybody, parents at least, they're all looking for ways to get their kids off of computers for a little while and get them to engage. Um, you know, research is showing that kids are losing the ability to make eye contact even if they're neurotypical. Um, they're losing the ability to be able to advocate for themselves. Um, and so these are ways that we can get them into an activity they're already buying into and then while we have them, teach them social skills, teach them the soft skills um, and get them to uh, learn some things that they would not otherwise maybe be. You know, if you said, hey, let's come learn some social skills, they might not be interested, but if you say, hey, here's a Nerf Blaster, suddenly they're, they're into it. <laughs> um, so, um, so uh, you know, again, I'm kind of going to glaze over some of this. You guys already know about EduLARP. I don't have to tell you about that. Um, so we started with these kind of all-day programs. We've been running these all-day programs for about four years. Uh, two to three times a year, depending, and they are really based in literature, so they're living literature programs, which then hooked a lot of libraries and community centers and after-school programs and things like that to want us to come do it for, for them. So instead of a six-hour event, now we're doing a micro-LARP that's two hours, where we incorporate a lot of movement activities. If it's a Harry Potter-inspired thing, we're doing Quidditch. If it's Percy Jackson, we're doing Troll Ball. Anybody know Troll Ball? You should know Troll Ball because it was invented in your country. Um, <laughs> uh, so Troll Ball is this super awesome game that um, instead of using a ball, you use the head of a troll, which obviously isn't real yet. Um, so, uh, and, and everybody's got a sword, and you go, you know, if you get hit, you go down on one knee, there's a healer that comes in. Literally every kid loves Troll Ball. Everyone <laughs> is looking for a reason, you know, for an excuse to hit their friends. We give them that, so we are popular. Um, other things that uh, we are doing for enrichment, I think I already talked about this, social and academic applications, the physical movement, um, NERF, um, you know, all of that stuff. Um, again, I'm going to kind of glaze over this. We'll let Peter talk a little bit more about the therapeutic LARP that we're doing. So what has happened is that as we've been doing this now, it's been five or six years, uh, we actually created a company that does this. Uh, we have Friday Night NERF every single Friday. We've got a bunch, 30 to 50 kids come in every Friday and run around with Nerf Blasters and, um, and learn some, some cool skills at the same time. Um, and so, uh, and then we do these all day LARPs and we're just now this year kind of figuring out how to do more traditional style LARPs. So we've got now some that are more serial, we have some that are, um, have different types of applications. So, um, and that's what Peter will talk about a little bit more. Uh, but Peter contacted us because one of his students was interested in coming to one of our all-day events and then he wanted to know what else we had to offer. And we happened to be just starting our serial program at the time, it was last summer, called The Hero's Journey, and some of his students came to, to that and that's how we got that started. And then when that ended, we were looking to continue that because they really benefited and I'll, he'll be able to tell you more about that. Um, the therapeutic tabletop game that we developed is called Quest. It is specifically developed for kids who have autism or other social deficits that need practice. Um, and the, what's different about this, because I know I've noticed that other people are also using these games for kids to teach social skills and other things, we are specifically developed it for simplicity. We want anybody to be able to pick it up and run that game if they're a therapist or an educator so that the majority of kids can get a benefit from it. Um, make it really, really easy for educators and other professionals to buy in. Um, so Evan will talk to you a little bit more about that. Um, in all of our games that we have, um, you know, we have a focus on safety. Um, we have some, you know, rules and things that we're that, that we just kind of make sure that the kids know, soft touch, you know, how not to hurt each other while you have fun and swing that sword. Um, we do a lot of, uh, you know, collaborative storytelling, a little bit of practice with that. 
Um, we, uh, we do a lot of team challenges and a lot of kind of, um, I guess, team building, you know, kind of traditional team building is worked in um, so that the kids are getting the benefits of that as well. Um, so here are some of our enrichment programs. This awesome guy is at our Eagles Club program. This is our Harry Potter inspired event that we've done about five times. Um, the kids are really into Harry. Is anybody not into Harry Potter? <laughs> like you say Harry Potter and people are just like, oh my gosh. So um, we have a total blast with this. It's an all day event. We do it at a local Unitarian church. Um, and uh, we've created our own kind of backstory so as not to infringe on anybody's intellectual property. Um, but it's really fun to watch the kids get assigned to these houses that we've made up and this whole backstory and lore and they are into it and they are like, no, I am a grizzled heart and so I am the friendliest person ever and, you know, they really buy into, um, you know, embodying the things that we tell them that their house represents um, and it's really cool. We've done a Star Wars inspired LARP, we've done a zombie LARP, um, we are, we just this past weekend started a LARP for young children and other children, you know, up to probably about 10 years old who are, it's specifically to practice social skills, so there's no combat, and that's a new thing for us. So they are basically solving problems with friendship. It was inspired by a tabletop role-playing game called Golden Sky Stories, and that's all about um, these uh, henge, which are, you know, shape-shifting fairies. So we call it Fairy Tales, Adventures in Friendship Forest, and um, they have to figure out, you know, through their powers of animal cuteness, how to uh, help people be friends, and, and it was amazing. Um, so much fun. So therapeutic LARP, and I, I know I, I crushed you all that because I'm trying to give them some time to talk a little bit more about these therapeutic applications. So this is Peter. He's going to talk about the therapeutic work that we developed and some of the things that we have. This is the Resource Institute, specifically Meadow Ridge Academy. Uh, I'm the director of competency services, which is a um, really confusing title. Uh, basically, I help students develop like executive functioning, discover a sense of self. Uh, it's, it's an amazing job. And uh, basically, it's one of the hardest jobs in the world. Um, the population we work with are students suffering from uh, complex childhood trauma. Um, a lot of these students don't feel safe um, outside of their safety bubble. It's like fight or flight all the time. So how do we give them an opportunity to get out of fight or flight and start exploring their self and taking chances in things that might seem really mundane to us, like writing a resume? Um, group therapy is something that is very difficult to get buy-in from students. Um, if you want to get a student to sit down and say, we are going to do resume writing today. Um, people with complex trauma, uh, that's incredibly difficult to sit down and be in your own head for that amount of time. For me, somebody not with complex trauma, sitting down and doing a resume is just something I don't even want to do. So <laughs> getting the students to do that was really difficult. We were in a, a system where we had a lot of kids just playing sports and basketball. And as the population changed, there was this group of kids that was over in the corner swinging sticks at something. Uh, I go over and I ask what they're doing, they tell me they're LARPing. Um, at the time, I know nothing about this, but I can see that they're passionate about it, so we need to build this into it, I mean, Kristen. Um, and I say, oh, I gotta get these kids, um, I gotta sneak in the vegetables with the ice cream, is basically my idea at this point. So what we do is we have this LARPing adventure, um, but they can't go on the adventure until they pitch to the queen why they should be going on the adventure, <laughs> what kind of experience they have, and then self-advocating for themselves how much money they should make. Um, uh, <laughs> nobody questions how alike it was to my resume working workshop. And they are just ready to go. So the first week we see people saying, you can pay me whatever you want, I'll go on the adventure. They do the adventure, they can pay whatever, right? Then they blow the money on the nicest sort that they By the last week, everybody's saving money, advocating for uh, as much money as they think they can realistically get. The kids are 100% buying into this system, right? So it goes really well. Kids are working together. They're trying stuff out in a, in a really trauma-informed way. So we see that this works. Uh, the kids have come a long way. So we're going to go. We're going to go for a little something that's a little more difficult in our next six-week session, and that's emotional regulation. We sit down with these kids in group therapy, and we say, we want to work on our emotional regu regulation. Let's do some deep breathing. When well, they sit in their head, they do some deep breathing. Those traumatic thoughts come back. It's scary, right? So we're now going to do an adventure uh, that we had done in, I guess, in the winter, um, where they're actually coming up against NPCs that represent characters they have to emotionally regulate to get to the next chamber. 
to get to the next group. These kids who won't sit down and work on emotional regulation will go up to this character who's having a panic attack and teach that character emotional regulation skills. There is one point where 10 students who will never work together have a rap battle with one of these NPC characters to uh, basically get them to emotional regulate. And this is something you won't see because they're in a safer environment. This world is providing them an opportunity that our world failed them. We're giving them an opportunity to grow through this LARPing world, which is an amazing thing. The, the developments they make are uh, huge. Um, and one thing as I just go to edit is, um, we did this truth circle thing, and to get through this truth circle, they had to share a truth about their character. Not one of them shared a truth about their character to get through that, they shared a truth about themselves. So they shared something that was deep about family trauma, that was deep about, I don't think anybody here likes me. And these are kids that won't share anything with their clinicians, so why are they doing that? Like, what is coming out in this moment, why do they finally feel safe to do that? And I'm actually going to yeah. And, and that's, you know, I think, um, one of the things is we look at clinically what is going on for kids in that moment is the separation between yourself and another and, and, and their character, the character that they've developed, this magic circle. But um, there's been a lot of research on a concept called bleed, which Sarah Bowman actually did a lot of really good work on. And what I, you know, we have to mention that here. So it is what happens inside of a, a LARP is something that they take they take with them. Kids especially that veil between um, what happens in video games and what happens in storybooks that they're reading and what happens in their fantasy reality and then what is actually internalized for them uh, in their personal life is the veil is very thin. So what we, what, we, what we have here is a prime opportunity for their character because they can't do the skills like building self-confidence, they can't do the skills like believing that they can overcome uh, some obstacle because in their world they haven't been able to, right? But as a character, what we've got are kids who now, you know, I, my name is Darian and I am, you know, a level two knight or whatever. I can do those things and I gain success. So what happens is that they then internalize that success and they go out into the world once they break the circle and they have that feeling of success, right, of accomplishment. So, um, okay, sorry. <laughs> I can talk a lot about that. Um, the, the tabletop uh, role-playing game, Quest, is we're, we're doing a lot of the same thing. We're teaching social skills. We're, we, it's you know, led by a therapist um, who has in mind what are the things that are going on for each of these kids, what are the skills that they're going to be developing. And then as we work together as a team, we are, we are uh, nudging and encouraging these, ki these kids to develop these social skills. So for example, um, we had you know, a kid who, uh, you know, I want to take everything and I want to, um, you know, I'm going to backstab everybody and I'm going to run away with the treasure. So that happens. He goes out and all of his friends at the, at the game are like, what are you doing? You can have a, an, a, an intense negative reaction to this, right? He makes the decision, oh crap, he, he realizes how unsuccessful that idea was. He turns it around right away. Oh, I was just possessed by the evil, you know, the evil sword. I drop it and... <laughs> so he, he was able to make a really risky decision, right? A really socially risky decision with very little consequence because this is a very low risk environment for that. He realized what the consequences were and he turned it right around and was able to re-engage with his peers. So those are the kinds of things that we're looking for. Those are the kinds of things that are making this type of intervention so uh, therapeutically and clinically successful. I think that's all the time. <laughs> yeah, so I'm just going to wrap up real quick by saying that um, you know, the future of Mastermind is that we are uh, going to be moving to a distributed workforce. Uh, kind of a gig economy where our goal is going to be to train individuals in their own geographic area to run all of our curriculum and program. Um, we're starting with NERF because that's how we started and then we'll be rolling out these other programs and hopefully uh, we can infiltrate the world with role playing and all of this goodness. Uh, Anna, um, do you find um, that the participants who take part in the new project have any interest in after they graduate or move on coming back and volunteering or working with the For the New project? Yes, some of them are and we have like uh, in my city we have like three uh, graduates who from time to time appear and help us with either with some 
particular events or go to the other orphanage or are ready to go. But uh, the problem is that when they graduate, they have to like to make their own life. Yeah, and uh, that is a problem because uh, Russian educational system like, doesn't take care of them and they feel lost. So maybe that's the reason why they come. They, uh, especially why they come back when they have personal relationships with some of the volunteers or with me. Other questions? Yes. I have a question for uh, Michael about the, uh, about one of the elements you talked about with the New Zero, New, New Zero game was uh, exploration and resource extraction. And I wonder how you address themes of colonialism and like how much they're, what we're either making use of the land versus pillaging the land and, and what could be the various three groups might interact with the same resources and share or not share them. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, first, I, I wasn't really allowed to go into that that much because of the Alberta, Alberta program of studies. It's uh, put under a different unit. I can't remember if it's the eighth grade even. Uh, when I was uh, sort of shadowing Mr. Cozy before my practicum, he was actually doing one of those uh, units. Uh, so I, I wasn't supposed to go into that that much. And uh, since the setting is post-apocalyptic, um, there wasn't any other, except for these three arcs, any other sort of sentient uh, communities that they could colonize. And I, I didn't really want to go into that precisely because of the program of study issue. I wanted to keep it to you know, how how do we work in economic scarcity? And, so, and then what what is the mechanism? How does scarcity change the value of things? Um, and uh, because that leads us into more political economy. Uh, so I, I would have gone outside of the curriculum that I was supposed to be teaching for that. Um, I was somewhat lucky, I should say, that they did start, you know, turning their technological advantages against each other. Um, I have no idea what I would have done. <laughs> there was talk about it, but to tell you what, because I just grabbed the, the deck of cards that come to the Mutant Year Zero game, and then sort of when they were doing their exploration, oh, you find something, let's just grab a card and see what happens. And one of them picks a card that's a grenade. <laughs> that one up here, this is going to happen. <laughs> but uh, yeah, aside from a couple of coups within a, a community, there was not the, the uh, uh, we're going to invade the other one and enslave them. It's a ninth grade class, and, and things like that can happen in, in young minds for sure. Uh, I can't really tell you why it didn't in this case, but uh, it's certainly <laughs> something that, that me and Mr. Cozy will, will talk about. Because if, if, if we manage to make this something that other teachers can use, it's definitely an issue that, that we have to be prepared for. And, and the teachers that are using it would have to be able to handle when or if it happens, right? So. Yeah, thanks. Uh, this is for Andrew, but also potentially relevant to everyone else out there as well. You mentioned you were working with uh, counselors who didn't have LARP backgrounds. So what? Were there tools you used to help sort of bring them up to speed and then teach them to be guidance figures within the water? Uh, so we used, we helped them, we used a narrative storyboard, is how we helped them figure it out. So we kind of broke up the experience into like six sections, like arrival, orientation, experience exit, etc. And then we said, okay, for each of these sections, like what can you use, like who are the characters that are going to be there? what props do they need, what's going to happen in the story during each of these sections. And we had them plot it all out verbally and then draw pictures to kind of fit along with that to kind of help maybe get those creative agencies. That's what it does a lot. Cool. And, uh, we've got time for two more, so one, two. I think a springboard off of uh, mm -hmm. Books' question and also something that I'm hearing is a reoccurring theme. It seems to be that one of the, the challenges with getting like the rest of the humans on board is teaching these LARP literacies and this language of LARP and how to do it. So uh, I've heard lots of different people share ideas what that's going to look like from anyone here. What does that look like going forward? Is there something that's going to actually need to be taught to people in schools as a skill or is it going to come from the outside through technologies? Like, what does that look like? It means like what is the basis, like the most minimal uh, 
elements that um, that normies can absorb, right? Um, to get them on board and get them, you know, into it and get them understanding and getting their and well for us because it's with kids, you know, getting a parent to say, okay, this is something that is not completely overwhelming. I think when we did our first multi-day LARP and we had kind of a little orientation with the parents and the kids have no problem. Kids buy into this like that. So some of this is going to be some of this is going to be a time thing, right? These kids that have grown up with creating a character and understanding their stats in a video game sense, they I go to a library in Western Mass and I say, "Okay, you guys are all wizards and you all have wands and this is these are your special skills." And they're like, "Cool, let's do it." Like totally like not LARP literate kids. So some of it is that, I think. And then the other is if you need people to help, it just has to be as you got to give them some support. You got to sometimes you have to script it for them. Um, and, and then just give them the confidence that they can, you know, that they can play a character, you know, if you're talking about an NPC. Um, and, and make it as easy and simple as possible by, by just taking the stuff they really, really need and leaving everything else to it doesn't matter. Um, last question, because we need to get to break. <laughs> yeah, for, um, for Kristen, Peter, and Evan, I'm wondering about how um, you thought about the therapeutic implications of not only you know, teaching and having the kids learn the stabilization techniques for their trauma, but also how they were engaging with their own trauma narratives through the LARPing, mm -hmm. and, and how that came about in the play. I think speaking specifically about um, our population is, I think it's impossible not to. If we're providing them an environment where they can buy in, and then the us adults around them are buying in, it's, it's going to happen. Because they're creative, but I think the common denominator for all of us when we're in these scenarios is we're going to make it our story. Or there's going to be some emotional connection there. So it's almost, for me, it was getting out of the way of that and not trying to control their narrative and letting them letting them be in control of their story for the first time. Because they've been in a situation where adults have been in control of their story their whole life. And reminding myself, no, just hands off, step back. Yeah, I was going to say, it really is that concept of we, right? We, we don't have the ability, really, to compartmentalize it unless we have really good skill between what happens to us, what our body does. Our brain can't do it. So what our body is doing, our mind thinks it's happening to us. Right? So the same is true for actors, the same is true for you know, you, method actors, right? How frequently will have stuff like this happen where they've played a you know, drug addict and suddenly they're, they, they feel some of those uh, you know, the hardships from being, from being addicted because they've done method acting, right? So it's the same thing. Like our brains just don't have the ability to compartmentalize it. Like there is, you, you can't not, this is not therapeutic. I mean, this can't, I don't want to say this, this cannot not be therapeutic for anybody, right? Great. So thank you so much.